My name is Ruben Magdaleno. I'm the campus pastor for our Parker campus, and this is my lovely wife, Joanna. And this is the story of how God transformed our relationship. Ruben and I did not have a traditional beginning to our marriage. We got pregnant first and then got married. Because he and I both came from divorced homes, I don't think we had the idea of what marriage should look like because it was never modeled. So we made it up as we went along. We did everything that marriages look like from the outside. And I got so fixated on getting a better job, a family, a car, a big house, and having more kids that I ignored everything that was going on on the inside of our marriage. What my wife didn't know is that I was hiding a drug addiction for many years. And when I couldn't hide it anymore, I asked her if she would use drugs with me. Now it didn't take long for everything in our lives to fall apart. We went from having a home to being homeless, having jobs to committing crimes to continue our addiction. I single-handedly destroyed our family and especially our marriage. And I started relationships with other women and continued to get worse at my addiction and eventually ended up in prison. Then one day in 2008, I surrendered my whole life to Jesus Christ. And as I continued to go to church and started getting closer to God, my wife continued in her addiction. And I remember as a new Christian crying out to God, asking God, what do I do? Do I stay, do I wait for her or do I divorce her? Your word does say that if she's unfaithful, I have that right. He led me to Malachi 2.16, where it says, I hate divorce as the Lord God of Israel. To divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord of the heaven's army. And as a new Christian at that time, I said, okay, I think this is the way it works. So if you hate it, then I hate it too. And I'm so glad that I held on and listened to God's word when everyone around me was telling me to give up on her, especially when I started to give up on us. I was always reminded of his word. I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. When I found out about my husband's secrets, I felt so betrayed. I thought, how could he do this to me? I thought about all the things I had done to make this marriage work and how selfish he was for messing things up. What I didn't realize then was that I was also being selfish by only thinking about how this affected me and I never once asked him if he needed help. I lived my life of addiction feeling like this was all his fault, never once taking accountability for any of my part in this. When he got sober and better, I got worse. I was happy for him, but I was also very angry because he was now everything I wanted him to be when we first got married. My addiction got worse and so did the crimes I committed to support my habit. It didn't take long before I went to jail and it was in jail where I was stripped away from everything that I finally gave my life to Christ. I only asked God for one thing, to restore my family. Keeping Jesus at the center of our lives, forgiving each other, is when we started healing and the transformation for our marriage began. We gave God a broken marriage and he has put the pieces back together into this beautiful relationship. What I single-handedly destroyed, God has put back together. Husbands, I really wanna encourage you. It does start with you. By getting real with ourselves, looking in the mirror, stop blaming our wives and everyone around us and completely surrendering our lives to Jesus. Wives, we can always find something that we don't like about our husbands, things that irk us or even things that we see as unforgivable. But I wanna challenge you to take your marriage to God, including all of your faults too. You see, God had to transform me and him individually before our marriage was restored. The marriage we once had was dead, but God renewed our marriage by transforming our hearts first. That's how we continue to live a life transformed. <laughs>as we continue transformed, we're talking about healthy relationships. Uh, and I'm going to encourage you to take your Bible or your Bible app and turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 3 is our, our launching text for today. And uh, you'll find our text today, page 3. If, if, you, if you don't have a Bible and, and you want one, uh, please take one of those with you if you're in the room. Uh, and uh, we would love for you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, God will change your life. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible, let us know. We'd be glad to help you get one uh, that you can read, that you can understand, so that God can speak to you and change your life as well. Uh, hey, let me ask you this question. 
how did your relationship begin? How did your relationship begin? Uh, I love asking that question of couples. So if uh, you ever, you know, schedule lunch with me, just go ahead and have your story rehearsed. But, uh, but since that may not happen for a little while, uh, if you're, you know, with people, so if you're watching from home and there's more than just uh, the one couple of you, even if there's just a couple, then go ahead and talk about the relationships and how they began. Kids, ask your parents that question after the service. And, and if you guys are here in the room and you guys are going out afterwards, uh, look at the other people at the table and ask them those questions because I love hearing that story, how did your relationship begin? Uh, because it matters how things begin. And, and uh, I, I want you to understand, God created you for relationship. God created you for relationships. Now, if you believe that God designed and created this world, then also know that God designed us for relationships. And not only did he design us for relationships, he wants to bless us through relationships. Uh, the first chapter of Genesis is a story of how God intentionally, uh, systematically created the world and everything in it. And seven times, God says, it is good. In fact, one time he said, this is very good. And then Genesis chapter 2 is the beginning of relationships. It's how God created relationships. And, and, and God formed man, and, and man named cre creation, and the first time that something is not good in Scripture is before sin even occurred, when God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. And, and that's when, you know, he created a woman, and, and the two became one flesh, and, and it was very good. God created relationships, because it's not good to be alone. And then Genesis 3 our text takes us to the story of how sin came into the world and corrupted relationships. Corrupted relationships. That was the damage. So uh, we're going to read Genesis 3, verses 8 through 13. Let me set it up. Genesis 3 uh, begins with temptation. It's where the serpent comes to Eve uh, and, and says, uh, God said you could eat any tree, right? But not, and she goes, no, we can't eat that one. And he goes, oh, come on. You can eat it. You won't die. God's, God's lying to you. He's not telling you the truth. That's not going to happen. In fact, when you eat of it, you're going to be like God. See, that's that kind of what we all want, right? Of course, the real problem was that the one you know, rule that God had for the garden, for paradise, was a diet rule. <laughs> See, we're still unable to break that sin, right? So... Uh, the serpent tempted Eve. Eve uh, ate from the tree, uh, the knowledge of good and evil. She gave it to Adam. Adam followed suit, and we pick up the story in verse 8. This is right after they realized they were naked, and they put the fig leaf stuff together and, and uh, covered themselves. Verse 8, it says, And they, Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Now, God knew where he was, but, you know, again, this is about relationships. And, and Adam said, uh, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Again, he knew the answer, but he's asking the question because it's about relationship. And verse 12, the man said, the woman whom you gave to me, be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate it. And then the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Now, the story continues. It's the curses of sin and on relationships and on marriage and, and on work and all of that that's part of it. It's foreshadowing about Jesus. Everything is there. But we're talking about relationships, and I want to talk about healthy relationships. Healthy relationships. And we're going to talk about healthy relationships by looking at a example of terrible relationships. Okay, we're going to learn from the bad example set by Adam and Eve in this one story, in this context, of the very first relationship. So uh, now understand, this is, this is about marital relationships, but it's also about family relationships, and it's about friendship relationships, and it's about parent-child relationships, and it's about work relationships and friendships. 
what we're talking about is about all your relationships. Because if you take the principles of God and apply them to all your relationships, all your relationships will be healthy. So to begin, let's talk about some principles of healthy relationships. Healthy relationships are transparent. Sin tempts us to hide. Sin tempts us to hide. So uh, verse 8, look at this again. The, very, the, the first one we read, And they, Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife did what? They hid themselves from God. They hid themselves. Why? They, they, they knew that they had messed up. They knew that they had sinned. And immediately the temptation was to hide. They wanted to cover up. Because of sin, they went from being naked and unashamed to being clothed and ashamed. You see, sin is always going to tempt you and I to hide. Because we're embarrassed, because we're afraid, because we're ashamed. And, and, and so we fear discovery. We keep secrets. I don't want you to find out about the stuff I've done wrong. You don't want me to find out about the stuff you've done wrong. That's why some of you avoid me. Uh, be honest, you like me from a distance. You know, he's up on stage. We just call him pastor. We have to, but you go to lunch with me, and he's going to ask us questions. I already told you one of them, so you can rehearse the answer. But some of you are like, I, that, that's the last thing I want to do is get that close, because then you might find out something about me. See, we, we like that covering. Uh, we like pretending to be something that we're not. Right? We, we want to appear better than we actually are. I, I, and I know this because I grew up in church. I grew up in churches all across this country, and, and that was prevalent as people who, who put on their Sunday best, and they went to church and they acted a way that, that was an act because they didn't do it Monday through Saturday. They were different. And if you got to know them, you saw that difference. And, and, and so I grew up surrounded by hypocrisy because people didn't want to be discovered because they were afraid of the judgment that was going to be offered them by other people. So let me just be really clear. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ... If you believe that Jesus actually is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, if you believe that he really died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then God is calling you to be honest. He's calling you to be transparent. He's calling you to be truthful about who you are and what you struggle with. That's why I love recovery groups. I mean, we've got recovery ministries here. Celebrate Recovery is awesome. Uh, there's a lot of you involved in other recovery groups in town. That is a beautiful thing because, you know, it's hard to be in a recovery group and, and not be honest. Because they start off with disclosure. Everybody in the group already knows we're all messed up, so let's be honest. That's really what church ought to be, right? Since we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, then why are we pretending to be better than we are? Let's be honest. Let's embrace transparent living because that's going to change our lives and it's going to lead to healthy relationships. So if you want healthy relationships, you have to travel in truth. It, it, it'll, it'll make a difference in your marriage. It'll make a difference in your family, with your kids. It'll make a difference where you work. All of your relationships need transparency. So healthy relationships are transparent and healthy relationships are trusting. Because sin causes us to fear. Again, look at verse 10. And, and uh, Adam is uh, responding to God and he says, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. I was afraid. Fear came out of his sin, out of his rebellion, and so he tried to hide from God. Uh, Adam was afraid of God's reaction. Adam was afraid of the consequences of his choices, and so he tried to hide from God. And, and there are so many people who are living in, in fear. There are so many people who are relating out of fear. Fear of betrayal, fear of abandonment, fear of humiliation, fear of rejection. And, and, and you know what fear causes us to try and do? It causes us to try and control other people so they don't hurt us. Let me say that again. Fear causes us to try and control other people so they don't hurt us. 
It's what we do because we're trying to protect ourselves because we're afraid we're going to get hurt. And so we push other people away before they can push us away. Or, or we, you know, try to control their actions and control what they do and who they're with because we're afraid they're going to hurt us. It, it, it's a terrible motivator for relationships. And if you're relating in fear, then your relationship is going to be unhealthy because trust is the foundation for healthy relationships. I'm going to say that again. Trust, trusting your partner is the foundation for healthy relationship. Trusting your friends is the foundation for healthy relationships. Trusting your children appropriately is the foundation for healthy relationships. Um, you see, when two people trust each other, relationships can thrive. Of course, faithfulness is, is part of that because if you're not faithful in that relationship, then trust is destroyed, whatever that faithfulness looks like. But trust is essential for any healthy relationship. So we have to decide to be transparent, trusting, and we have to decide to be responsible. Responsible. Because sin tries to blame. I, I absolutely love these verses now that I've been happily married for 36 years. The man said, verse 12, the woman who you gave to be with me, God, she gave me the fruit and I ate it. And then Eve, right? The serpent, it's the serpent's fault. The serpent deceived me and I ate it. You know who created the serpent, God, right? Wink, wink. They blamed God. I, I, I absolutely love that. They rebelled against God and they blamed God for their rebellion. And, you know, and, and Adam didn't just blame God, but he blamed Eve too. God, it's your fault, uh, and it's her fault. It's not my fault. It's, there. it's, your, it's, it's you guys. You guys did it. Uh, it's a tragic picture of unhealthy relationships. That, that's what that is. But let me just say this. Anytime that you are blaming or accusing your spouse, your kids, or your friends, your coworkers, it's unhealthy. Can okay, I say it again? Anytime you're blaming your spouse, your kids, your friends, your coworkers, you've moved into an unhealthy part of relationship. And I know none of you ever do any blaming or accusing in this room, so I'm, I'm safe there. But this is for people who are watching online or something, because, you know, they, they're, they're the ones, right? You see, healthy relationships require taking responsibility for your actions. You heard that in the testimony of Reuben and Joanna. They both took responsibility. Reuben for leading his family off a cliff. Joanna for, for being angry while her husband is repenting because she didn't want to take responsibility for her actions. You see, blaming others is rejecting responsibility. It's not my fault. Really? But that's unhealthy. And we are so prone to it. We, we don't want to take responsibility. We, we want someone else to own it. We want to be guiltless, but the only way you get to guiltless is through confession because when we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and if we confess our sins one to another and pray for each other, we'll be healed. Healthy relationships require confession. I go back to that transparency part, but that's taking responsibility. So here, let me confess. A couple of months ago, uh, uh, oh, uh, let me start the story before I get to a couple months ago. A couple years ago, my wife gave me a watch that is a golf watch. A any who actually knows what a golf watch is in here? Because this, this will make it easier. Like six of you. Uh, it's great. <laughs> All right. A golf watch is GPS, a uh, little device that tells me on the golf course how far I have so I know which club I need to miss hit to not be where I want to be. <laughs> okay. It's a really handy tool. Uh, in, informative on the golf course makes me feel really secure right before I missed a shot. So uh, uh, anyway, so I had this golf watch. I've been loving it, but it's got a really weird charger and you have to charge it after you use it. Otherwise, it's no good because it's just dead. And so, uh, uh, and I was keeping the charger where Meralda didn't want it, which is in the kitchen because I knew where it was. And, uh, and then it wasn't there. You know, we had company over, we cleaned up stuff and and, uh, and I couldn't find the charger. And I was like, hey, uh, do you know where the charger is? And, and she said, well, I, 
I, I cleaned off everything, and I think I put all the chargers in, in here in this drawer. And so I went and looked, and I was like, it's not there. Uh, what did you do with it? And so she looked, and she tore the area apart. She goes, I can't find it anywhere. And, uh, and so then she uh, ordered a new golf watch. Uh, I didn't know this, but she ordered it uh, you know, for a Christmas surprise. And they're not cheap. And, and you know, ladies, you know what happened right after she ordered it, right? Yeah, I found it right where I put it. Yeah, and, you know, and, and I had kind of, you know, assumed and stated out loud that she accidentally threw it away, and she actually thought that she had accidentally thrown it away, and, and the, those assumptions were wrong, and I had blamed her, and she'd even blamed herself, and then there it was right where I put it so I wouldn't lose it. And... Uh, <laughs> And, and then she surprised me with a golf watch that I didn't need uh, because we'd found that other one. And, and so I repented and I apologized and we laughed about it because that's what happens when you take responsibility. Now, healthy relationships are transparent, they're trusting, they're responsible. I'd encourage you to look at your relationships and, and evaluate how you're doing in those areas, but, but really to apply those behaviors you need to grasp the concept of relational reciprocity. Relational reciprocity. I know it's kind of a fancy word, but reciprocity is the principle that we reap what we sow. Okay, we reap what we sow. And, and by the way, the idea you reap what you sow is repeated over and over and over again in Scripture. Uh, Jesus said, uh, give and it will be given to you for the measure you use will be measured back to you. That's reciprocity. You're going to reap what you sow. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Yeah, if you give mercy, you're going to get mercy. That's reciprocity. The Apostle Paul actually spelled it out in Galatians 6 when he said, hey, don't be deceived. God isn't mocked. Whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. If you sow to the flesh, you'll from the flesh reap destruction. If you sow to the Spirit, from the Spirit, you'll reap eternal life. Okay, that's reciprocity. But the Apostle Paul talked about it in terms of marriage relationships too. In Ephesians 5, he said, the man who loves his wife loves himself. Now, listen to that again. The man who loves his wife loves himself. Isn't that, isn't that cool? That's reciprocity. Whatever you put into your relationships is what you're going to get back from your relationships. That's why transparency and, and all and trust and, and, and uh, the whole responsibility is so important in relationships because you put that in, you're going to get that back. But if you're in your relationships, if you're deceitful, if you're accusative, if you're angry, if you're fearful, if you're unkind, guess what kind of relationships you're going to have? Yeah. But if you're loving and kind and helpful and honest, then that tends to come back to you in the relationships that you have. Now, there are, there are exceptions to that rule because there are narcissists out there and there's abusers out there and there's addicts out there and, and they want you to enable them and, and do all this kind of stuff for them. So healthy boundaries are necessary for healthy relationships too, but the principle of reciprocity is real. The man who blesses his wife gets blessed. The wife who blesses her husband gets blessed. The, the parents who bless their kids get blessed. The, the one who's a great friend usually has great friends. Why? Because of relational reciprocity. And once you grasp this, it changes your relational dynamic tremendously. Once you understand this, you go, you own this, you go, hey, I'm gonna do this. It, it changes the way you think, it changes the way you approach every single relationship that you have. For instance, once I stopped asking God to fix Meralda, and started asking God to fix me so I could be a better husband, it's amazing how the relationship got better. Now, see, some of you are laughing. I'm being completely honest. Because what we tend to do is we tend to look at the faults of our spouse or our friends or whoever we're dealing with, and we pray for them, for God to make them like we want them to be. That, that's us praying selfishly. 
That's what I mean when I say fix them. Because all of us are tempted to pray that God will fix other people. But the reality is you don't have any power over those other people. Yes, you should pray for them, especially where they're struggling. But when you pray for yourself, when you invite God to do a work in you, when you agree with the Holy Spirit about the work that he wants to do in your life, in relationship, and you say, hey, God, teach me to love like Jesus. Because as a husband, that's what the standard, right? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Okay, God, help me to love better. Help, help me to you know, be this husband that, that she deserves. Help, help me to think differently about this. And, and see, what happens is you control you, and so you invite God to help you be who God wants you to be, and, and it changes the whole dynamic of the relationship because now you're taking responsibility for you. Um, so what are you focusing on in your relationship? Your spouse's faults or your faults? Your kids' faults or your faults? Your friends' faults or your faults? Your coworkers' failures or your own? What, what are your thoughts and prayers focused on? Because taking responsibility for the only one that you can control in a relationship leads to health. Because the one who blesses his wife gets blessed. The one who, bless, the one who blesses her husband gets blessed. The ones who bless their kids get blessed. So when you take responsibility for yourself, then you start getting blessed and live in blessing because you're blessing other people. Now, some of you are going, that sounds really great, but I don't even know where to begin. That sounds really great, but I don't know how to start. I wanna, I wanna embrace this relational reciprocity. I wanna start being a blessing. How do I do that? Glad you asked, because I'm gonna share with you habits that will bless Habits that will bless. This is not exhaustive list. list. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, just to help you out so you can do a check on yourself throughout the week, this is gonna be in an acrostic. It's gonna spell the word bless, B-L-E-S-S, -S, so that you can remember these things and hopefully be blessed because you're thinking about them so God can transform your relationships because you're focused on God working in you and not fixing all the people around you that are messed up. Okay? So here we go. Five habits that will bless you and bless the people around you so that you can be blessed, okay? The first one, the B, is believe, okay? Believe. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. He says, we give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus, Paul talks about their, their labor of love, their steadfastness of hope, all this, uh, and, and he's not there. He's not there. He's, he's hearing about it. And what he's saying is, I believe in you, Thessalonians. I believe in what you're doing. I believe in how you're living. I believe in the work that's going on. He says, I believe in you, and I'm thanking God for you. you know, what does that have to do with relationships? Everything. Decide that you're going to believe the best about your spouse. Decide that you're going to believe the best about your kids. Decide you're going to believe the best about your friends. Decide you're going to believe the best about your coworkers. By the way, that's what trust really is. Trust is deciding that you're going to, you're going to believe the best about people, that they want the best for you, they're working their best at their job, they're, they're giving their best, they're trying their best, and when they don't, they'll admit it because it's a relationship built on trust and transparency. So believe the best about the people in your life because an attitude change impacts everything. I told you the story about the golf watch, we're still laughing about that, and, and here's the thing. When I believed that Merelda accidentally threw away the, the cord, I didn't get angry. Why? Because I knew that she would never do that on purpose. I know that she wants to bless me, even if it's not in the ways that I think she should in the moment. But she's always trying to bless me, which is why she bought a replacement, because she thought she'd thrown the other one away. It was that simple. But when you believe the best about people, you treat them with the expectation of success, and you treat them with a great measure of grace. Because... 
you know is an accident. They didn't do it on purpose. Um, see, some of you are looking for failure. You're, you're expecting the worst from your spouse. You're expecting the worst from your kids. You're expecting the worst from your coworkers, maybe even your friends. And you're looking for every single offense, anything that can be interpreted as negative, and, and you're letting it be a, a rain cloud on your life because you're, you're just watching for the slightest form of disrespect or offense, and, and, and you don't believe that your spouse wants to bless you. You don't believe that your kids want to bless you. You don't believe that your friends want to bless you. And everything is flavored by your disbelief. Can, can I encourage you to ask God to help you change that attitude, to decide to believe, because you're not gonna get blessed without it. Because when you really honestly believe that people are out to get you or people are, are, are inclined to hurt you, you're not gonna bless any of them. No, let's just make it about marriage. If you're married and you think your spouse isn't gonna bless you, you're not gonna bless them, therefore you're not gonna get blessed by them. That, that reciprocity just goes out the window because you're cutting it off. You got to believe in your spouse. You got to believe in your friends. So the B is believe. The L is listen. The Apostle James, Jesus' half-brother, says, Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. We should all learn that verse, shouldn't we? Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. He goes on to say, the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness that God desires. That's why you need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. So slow down and listen. Clarify when you're not sure what you heard. Don't accuse with question. Ask questions to clarify. You know the difference, right? Hey, what did you say is a clarification question. Why did you say that is an accusation, right? There's a, there's a difference. Sometimes we use questions to accuse. Ask for clarification. Because I know what's happening. I, I, in, in your relationships, you guys aren't hearing each other. You know how I know that? Because we don't hear each other. Because we do the really stupid thing, like talk to each other from the opposite sides of the house. Right? And so what do you do? You just yell. So now they hear you yelling at them, and they didn't hear you correctly, and they misheard you, and then they're mad because you, they just called you a name. They didn't call you a name. You just didn't hear them, right? But you don't clarify. You just walk in there and yell at them. They're confused, so they just yell back. Next thing you know, you have a fight on your hands. Why? Because you're deaf. All right, so let's confess. How many of you talk to each other from other rooms in the house? Yes. We all need to repent. Your marriage would be so much healthier if you just walk into the room and start the conversation when you, they can see you. Okay, I, look, we laugh about it because I'll say, hey, I, I know you didn't say this, but here's what I heard. So, uh, so listen, I, I'll also just confess this, that uh, you know, I love going out to eat with my wife because neither one of us picks up phones or iPads and or tears on the TV and gets distracted. We can actually hear each other. So practice listening. And that whole slow to anger part, seriously. Why are you getting angry so fast? This practice alone is gonna improve your relational health tremendously. So believe, listen. Third, encourage. Encourage. Again, the Apostle Paul writing to the Thessalonians, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 says, therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you were doing. Encourage. Hey, every time you open your mouth, your words are gonna bless or they're gonna curse. That, that, that's a reality. Bless or curse. Every time you speak, so choose to encourage. Hey, you can look at your words in one of three ways. Just run a filter and go, okay, you're either gonna complain, critique, or encourage. Okay, complain, critique, or encourage. That, that's generally the three categories you're gonna find yourself talking about. You go, no, I just disseminate information. It's still gonna fall in one of those categories. If you want to live in blessings, in other words, if you want to have those healthy relationships, then practice encouragement with your spouse, with your children. Parents, your, your words are shaping their life view of themselves. Encourage them with your friends. Um, hey, this is just something I, I thought and, and I realized, I, I think it's true. Almost everyone likes cheerleaders better than critics. 
Okay? You, you guys take a poll at dinner. It'll work. Take a poll in your house while you're watching. It, it, it's true. Almost everyone prefers cheerleaders to critics. So encourage. The first S is serve. Serve. The Apostle Paul in Philippians 2 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility of mind consider others more important than yourselves. Okay? Serve other people. If you want to bless your relationships, live as a servant. And some of you are going, but, but I want people to serve me. I don't want to be their servant. That's great. You're not going to be blessed. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just telling you, you're kind of going, well, but I, I want to be blessed by the people serving me. Great, then you'll be blessed by them serving you, but you won't be blessed in terms of relationship, in terms of having healthy relationships, because if you want to have a healthy relationship, then you need to serve other people. You need to adopt the identity and role of a servant. Why do I say that? Because it's what Jesus did. It's what he taught. It's what he modeled for us. He said, whoever wants to be great must be the servant of everyone. And, and then he went and died for us so that we could have life. Your default mode is either selfish or serving. Okay? You're either acting selfishly or you're acting as a servant. And, and you have to figure out which one defines your life. Which one is most prevalent in your life, because it's going to be one or the other. Uh, so men, take out the trash, finish the project, clean the toilet, okay? All right, ladies, I really expected a standing ovation when I said that one. You guys must be sleeping tonight or something. Uh, hey, kids, uh, you want to freak your parents out? Start doing your chores without them asking Clean your room without being harassed, okay? You know, take out the trash the first time they ask you, and uh, they, your parents, it'll change your family radically, and your parents will be like, what happened? And you'll be blessed, kids. I'm just telling you, this is the secret. You'll be blessed. So if you want to be blessed, serve other people. So believe, listen, encourage, serve, and the second S is share. Share. Uh, the Apostle Paul in Romans 12 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Uh, look, God wants us to celebrate with others. He wants us to, to weep with others, to be present with others in the moment and share their burdens and joys. That's what God wants. If, if you can't do this or if you don't do this, you're not going to be much of a friend or a parent or a spouse because this is compassion. And can I just honestly say, if you rejoice when others weep, if you're celebrating their failure, if you're uh, grieving when others rejoice because you're grieving their success, then your heart is really in a dark place and Jesus needs to change it. You see, God created us for healthy relationships. We're gonna receive back what we put into them. Are you gonna choose to bless? Um, now, if, if you're sitting here going, I want to, but I need some help understanding myself or understanding our relationship, counseling's available, Celebrate Recovery's available, uh, marriage mentoring's available, life groups are available. You just need to ask. You need to reach out and say, hey, we want to help because we want you to be blessed. You gotta choose in order to be blessed to live your life as a blessing to others. Will you pray with me? Father, you've blessed us. You've given us life in Jesus that we don't deserve and, and you have pursued a relationship with us through his death and resurrection. And we wanna say thank you. But God, you also see our lives. They're transparent to you, even if we've been trying to hide. And, and you know how selfish we are. You know how accusative we are. You know how so often we curse with our words rather than bless. And, and we just wanna repent. We want to invite you to change us. We want to take responsibility for our lives, and, and we ask that you would help us to be the men and women that you've created us to be, the, the husbands and wives that you've created us to be, the parents that you've created us to be, the friends that you've created us to be. We can't do it without you. So we yield to you now in Jesus' name. Amen.